Hey everybody, it's Andrew here at Vespa Portland, and in this video today we're going to be talking about the features and functions of the Vespa Primavera 50cc, really 49cc, scooter. So let's crack this here beer from Ex Novo Brewing and get that going. If you hear any background noise, it's because our tech, one of our technicians, Dustin, and sales manager, Natasha, are currently cleaning a carburetor on a buddy. Maybe they'll pop into the frame. I don't know. They're over there. Okay, before we get started with the features and functions of the Primavera 50, we should talk about what's legally required to operate the scooter on a roadway. Since we are Vespa Portland in Portland, Oregon, we're going to talk about Oregon. I'll talk about Washington a little bit too. But for the rest of you out there, thank you for subscribing to a uh, shop's YouTube channel that's not in your city. Uh, and check your local laws on what is required to ride a 50cc scooter. Uh, these scooters that are 49cc, I, I'm going to bounce back and forth between 49cc and 50cc because 50 is a nickname for a 49cc scooter. And why? Because we're in America and we like round numbers. Uh, none of these scooters in this class require a motorcycle endorsement in these two states. In some other states, they do. In some other states, you don't need anything. You can just ride it like it's a bicycle. In Oregon, you have to have at least a driver's license to operate one of these legally. And the DMV views mopeds as a, a traditional vehicle, like a car or a truck. Meaning, you cannot ride on the sidewalk, you cannot go in a bike lane, you can't lane split yet. It's coming. Uh, and you're going to have to pay for DMV registration, uh, have a license plate on your scooter, and carry motorcycle insurance. And of course, you're also going to need to wear a DOT-approved helmet while riding. Although we would recommend a riding jacket and gloves as a, an extra precaution. Just because you go slower on one of these scooters doesn't mean it's any less dangerous if a car was to run into you on the road. But let's not turn negative thoughts into things. Even if it's perfectly legal in your state to ride one of these scooters with just a driver's license, we still highly recommend that you familiarize yourself with some safe riding practices. Whether that means signing up for a motorcycle safety class in your city or state, or just watching a bunch of different like things I wish I knew as a new rider YouTube videos. On our channel, we actually have two videos that might help you out. There's one on defensive parking that was somewhat recent, and then uh, one about how to ride safely using this technique called the Smith System, which was developed in the 50s to keep semi-truck drivers safe on the road. Any kind of rider education that you can get your hands on could save your life in a sticky situation. But that's enough preaching from me. Let's get onto this scooter. The Primavera 50 is a lightweight and stylish, metal-bodied, fuel-injected scooter that's going to be great for in-city riding. The 50cc engine is not going to be the most powerful thing ever, and it's not meant to be, because if it was, you wouldn't be able to operate this thing with just a driver's license or less in certain states. Uh, you're going to expect a top speed on flat ground of about 30 to 35 miles an hour, depending on how much time and roads you have. It's going to be a fun and easy way to get around town. Uh, you could ride to your friend's house, you could go get an ice cream, grab a 12-pack of beer, go get some tacos, uh, you know, see the sights, smell the smells, whatever you want to do. Enjoy the sunshine. It's a scooter, and scooters are fun. This probably isn't going to be the scooter for you if you live on a hill or you have a very hilly commute. Full throttle, assuming you don't come off the throttle, uh, the Primavera 50 and Sprint 50 are probably going to drop into the low to mid 20 mile an hour range up a hill. If you need something that is going to be more powerful and is going to you know, meet or be, go beyond the posted speed limit on the street, you're going to want to take the motorcycle safety class and probably bump up to the 150cc version of this scooter. All right, we've covered plenty about how to ride this thing, where to ride this thing, and what it can do. It's time to move on to the functions of the Primavera 50. All right, let's get started with the key. So. The key in your Vespa Primavera is going to go into the ignition, which is right here. Uh, the key that comes with your bike, well, you get two of them. You have uh, this key and this key. They're identical. Put one in a safe place in your house somewhere and put the other one, of course, on your key ring so that you can ride with it. This key is going to also open up your seat. We'll show that momentarily, but that's, but that's also for. The other thing it does is, of course, go into the ignition and help you start the scooter. Okay, now we're down at the ignition. So there are four positions on the ignition, which you'll see here. There is lock, close, off, which is a uh, loop with an X through it, and on, which is a loop with no X through it. Main thing you wanna know is this lock function is your friend. Anytime you are not riding your scooter, unless it is in a locked, totally enclosed garage that only you have access to, 
and even maybe then. You'll want to turn your handlebars all the way to the left, pop that key in the bike, and turn the key to the left to the lock position. It's very important to lock your steering in public because without doing that, someone can easily just walk away with your scooter. Putting the key back in the ignition now, we're going to click over to the next position, which is the close position. What this one does is allows you to move the handlebars, but not allow anyone access into your storage. One click to the right of that is the off position. Now on the 150, this actually does some more stuff. You might see this little button right here. On the 50, this does nothing. On the 150, it's an electronic seat actuator. So pushing that button in the off or the on position, we actually electronically snap the lock to uh, open the seat. Not the case on the 50cc because you have to use the key to open the seat. In the off position, all you can do on the 50 is actually push in on the key and the glove box will open up, which I'll show you shortly. The next one over is the on position, which, and the scooter is kind of coming to life under battery power. On here, don't know if there's a glare or not, but you have uh, the fuel level. This bike is almost entirely full. It currently has zero total miles on it, and the time is allegedly 6.39. It is. That's what's gonna be on this digital part of the dash. Up here, you have the speedometer. It's gonna cap out around 50 because this is a 49cc scooter. It's not gonna really get to 50. You don't need to go further than that. Most of the time, your needle is gonna be about right here in the 30 to 35-ish range. On the outer ring, it's miles per hour. On the inner ring, it's kilometers per hour in this market. Other things that you'll see on here are the high beam and low beam indicator, an oil pressure indicator, a turn signal indicator that sort of looks like hazard lights. And uh, if you're real low on gas, the gas light will come on. There's also a check engine light over here that hopefully will never come on for you. If it does, talk to your local service center. And that is about it for the dash. So on the left side of the handlebars, you're going to have a brake lever, which is your rear brake. Uh, you're going to have the high beam and low beam switch. Your high beam can be switched on by sliding over to the left back to regular headlight. Down below that is your turn signal switch. You can go right or left with that. It's going to illuminate the turn signals as you see, but they do not self cancel. So you're going to have to remember to push in on this middle button to make sure that it cancels. And as you didn't hear, uh, you can see that the indicator is on for the turn signals, but it does not make any noise. I think it's a good practice on the Vespa to just every now and then hit your turn signal as you're going down the street. Every now and then you'll hit it and you'll click and you go, whoa, how long was that on? You don't want to be riding down the street, you know, signaling a turn that you're not going to make and then some car decides they can turn in front of you because they think you're turning, right? Down below that, you have your horn. This is what your horn sounds like. All right, on the right side of the handlebars, you have your front brake. The front brake is gonna provide about 70% of your braking power. So if you're used to a bicycle and kind of hiding out from your front brake, that does not translate to the scooters and motorcycles of the world. Your front brake is your friend. Unless you're on some kind of ultra slippery surface, then you should be using your back brake. Otherwise, um, when you're coming to a stop on a scooter, just easily, smoothly, gently squeeze both your brakes to come to a nice stop. Moving on. that. Red button right there is the kill switch. Uh, to the left is the kill position. Again, it'll look like the off position on your key where it's got the loop with the X. Uh, if that is to the left, your engine will not start and it will turn off a running engine. The reason is there's a US law that says you have to be able to turn off an engine without removing your hands from the handlebars. To start your bike though, you're gonna have to have it to the right side, the run side with the open loop. Down below that is your mode button. And on the Primavera 50, um, it doesn't slide or anything, it just presses in. And if you press in on it, it's going to cycle you through the total miles, the trip odometer A and the trip odometer B on your dashboard. Down below that, you have your electric start button. Your scooter comes with mirrors. And on the Primavera, they are a rounded shape, which will match the rounded headlight. If your mirror ever becomes loose, all you gotta do is slide this little guard up and then below it, you'll see this nut. This is a 17 millimeter nut. To make basic adjustments to your mirrors, you can just move the mirror like this. But if you need to make bigger adjustments, like your shoulders are too broad and you can't see anything but yourself, you can use the 17, loosen the nut, move the mirror to where you'd like it to be, tighten it back down. All right, we're gonna get this scooter started. I'm gonna walk through this as if the scooter was parked in public and the handlebars were locked as they should be. What you would wanna do is walk up to your scooter and pop the key in and turn it one click to the right, which is gonna release your handlebars. That lets you obviously get into a position to be able to ride. Next up, you're gonna to want to put your helmet on and whatnot. 
uh, but then click your keys two clicks over to the right side and your dashboard is going to come to life. You're gonna at that point want to make sure that your kill switch right here is to the right and then hold a break on either side. I kind of prefer to grab the left side so that my right hand can just hit the electric start uh, without any kind of obstruction. Sometimes if someone has a smaller hand and they're trying to hold this brake and hit this, they're kind of like throttling and you know, you don't need all that. Once your keys to the on position, your kill switch is to the right to the run position, grab a brake and hit that electric start. And your scooter will start right up. That's what it sounds like when it runs on the Primavera 50. Then you're riding, everything's good. You come to a stop and then you can just hit your kill switch with your thumb, it'll kill the engine, but you can see that the dashboard is still on because the battery powered portion of the scooter is still being powered. So it's important to, of course, turn your key to turn that off. Don't leave uh, in your garage, just leave the key on. You'll come back to a dead battery guaranteed. All right, next up, we'll talk about the glove box. The glove box is not going to open in the lock position. You can't push in. It's not gonna open in the closed position. You can't push in. You have to be in either the off or the on position, either one, to push in on the key and open up the glove box. It opens up just like this. Um, this also occupies the same space as your seat. So when your seat opens later, which we'll show, you're gonna wanna make sure this is out of the way so you don't kind of bump this thing off the track. Inside the glove box, you're going to have space on the Primavera 50 on both sides of the steering column. On this side here, you have a small compartment and the same on the left side. The left side also has a bonus USB charger so you can plug in your phone or other device. So also on the inside of your leg shield is your VIN plate. That's gonna be on the left side. It's this black plate right here. The main thing you're gonna see on it is your VIN number. That's gonna start right here at this Z and move itself all the way over into this uh, pressed area. It's a little bit hard to read, but your VIN is that entire number. Other things that are useful on here is the manufacturer of your scooter. So this particular bike was uh, July of 2021. It was built in uh, Pontedera, Italy. Below that, you're going to see your recommended air pressures for the scooter. The front cold says 26.1 PSI and the back says 31.9 PSI. This is not a completely scientific and specific air pressure that you absolutely must run. I typically run like three PSI more in my back tire just to kind of compensate for my weight. Stay somewhat close to that recommended air pressure. Don't go by the pressure on the tire. The tire is not taking into account the rider weight and the bike weight. Check your tires probably once a month. The more you check your tires, which is the only thing between you and the road, the longer life the tire is gonna have in it being properly inflated and uh, the better traction you're going to have with the road. Okay, coming down the leg shield here, uh, we're gonna get to the floorboards. Obviously your feet are going to go here and here, but this spot in between is the battery compartment. This is held on with four Torx fasteners. If you don't have one of those in your garage, no big deal. There's a toolkit that's included with your scooter under the seat that will have those. Turn those lefty loosey, pull that off and your battery will be underneath that if you ever have to change your battery. The battery terminal hardware is gonna just be a standard Phillips head screwdriver. Everybody has one of those. Expect the battery on your scooter to last probably three to five years, depending on how you're storing it. If it's outside all the time in the elements, it's gonna have a shorter lifespan. These are smaller batteries that are nowhere near the size of a car. And so uh, they're a little more susceptible to the elements. If you're keeping your scooter in a garage, should be no problem to kind of get well, probably four or five years out of it, assuming it's a quality battery like a Yuasa. If you're buying a battery online for like 29 bucks, don't expect much. That thing might die on you in like a year. At the back of the floorboard, you're going to see these little black pieces right here. These are passenger foot pegs, so their feet can be out of the way of yours. And as we kind of move up here to the seat, you're going to see the little locking mechanism that's on the seat itself. Let's take your key, pop it into the seat right here, and turn to the left, and your seat will pop open. Here, you're gonna see a under seat storage bucket with a note that says no pets. Don't put any ice cream in here either because the engine is below this seat bucket and it's going to get a little bit warm in here. So that would melt ice cream. And of course there's no air for a pet. I hope no one has ever put a pet in here, but who knows? If your helmet doesn't fit in this storage bucket, which it might when you buy it, but over time, this bucket fills up with things um, as we have seen. So if your helmet doesn't fit, you can kind of hang it on one of these posts on the side here. It will occupy this space or this space. And when you close the seat, the helmet is locked in. Right. This is a Biltwell uh, Bonanza Large. This thing does not fit. So that doesn't give me much confidence that this large Biltwell Gringo will fit either. Let's see. 
Nope. Uh, we could, nope, not gonna fit. So as you can see, the, if you're a large size helmet, chances are it's, you're gonna be a little out of luck with this thing. Pretty common though, a lot of scooters don't have the storage capacity to carry helmets that would actually protect you. They generally have the storage capacity to hold those like half helmets, like you would see someone on a Harley ride, which in a crash is basically useless. You can see that there is a service sticker reminder under the seat here. If you are a Vespa Portland customer, uh, we put this on every new bike and every bike we service to let you know when your next service is due, when that service interval is. Above that is your toolkit. Most people don't even know they have this because Vespas are pretty incredibly reliable. In here, you're gonna have a spark plug puller, a shock adjuster, and uh, a Phillips head, a flat head, and then the two Torx, I think T25 and T30 sizes on the uh, little screwdriver. If you ever add like a seat cover for the rain, you can actually stuff it into this little hole right here. I would recommend that you wait till it's dry first so that it's not just kind of molding up in there. The under seat storage bucket that we talked about a moment ago actually comes out of the bike. And that's nice in case you ever spill something in it and you wanna wash it. Of course, the real reason it comes out is so that technicians at your local dealer or service center can get into the bike to work on the engine if necessary. But it is a nice little perk that it comes out. Also under here is the gas. Uh, your Primavera is going to use Premium gas, 91, 92 octane, whatever's around your area. Um, you can fill in the nozzle like so. On the shorter nozzles, you might have to pull back the hood of the nozzle to kind of like make it flow. On the longer ones, it generally just flows on its own. You can uh, fill your own gas in Oregon as well. Um, little known fact, yeah, scooters and motorcycles, it's totally legal to pump your own gas here. Uh, unlike being in a car here where someone has to do it for you. I believe the tank, size on the Primavera 50 is like 1.8-ish gallons. Pretty much you can get away with putting a gallon in there and, uh, and call it good. It's probably gonna get you, geez, probably like 80 miles to the gallon, I would guess, uh, assuming that you are kind of an average weighted person on average riding conditions, not full throttling everywhere, not going up hills all the time, etc. Something super important that you should never do on your any scooter really, is to put your key in the under seat storage. Because if your seat accidentally falls closed, you are out of luck. You're gonna have to go home, you're gonna have to get that other key that came with your bike to come back, unlock the seat, get your normal key, and then get moving. Best practice is when your key is in the side of the seat, just leave it there. Don't take it out, <laughs> let it sit there. That way if it falls closed, no big deal, you just open it again. And one last feature on the Primavera seat that most people don't even realize they have, is on the front of the seat right here, you actually have a bag hook that will slide out. Um, it's not the best bag hook in terms of like its distance to the battery case. Um, if your feet are here, obviously your bag is gonna have to be tied pretty tight to uh, kind of occupy this space, but it is another storage hook uh, available to you on the scooter to maybe carry a bag of burritos or something like that. Assuming plastic bags haven't been outlawed in your state. Paper bag, eh, not gonna work. Moving on to the lights of the scooter. After model year 2020, uh, the Vespa lineup switched out from the halogen headlight to full LED on the headlight, tail light, which includes the brake and running light and the running lights that are in the body. So you're gonna see the headlight right here. And then when you add the high beam, it clicks in like so. And it's just a super bright light. It's definitely gonna get the attention of anyone on the road and light the way for you. And this is what the running lights look like in the front of the scooter. Uh, the rest of this light is actually a turn signal, which in the U.S. market is not a turn signal. Instead, in the U.S., uh, we are given these pod turn signals, which are up here. You can see hanging out underneath the handlebars of the bike. If these drive you insane, uh, they can be put back into the body of the scooter. The reason they're out of the body is that uh, this is too close of a distance for the DOT regulations on import. But once the bike's in the US, you can kind of do whatever you want. You know, you're taking a bit of a risk if someone pulls you over and notices that. But, um, you know, for the most part, no one really messes with a scooter. And it's going to be the same deal with the, the taillight. It's also full LED. When the key is in the on position, you're going to see the running light illuminate. And when you pull a brake either side, the brake light is going to illuminate in that full LED. It's really bright in the dark. Obviously, this is a uh, bright building, but uh, people should have no problem seeing that. 
Again, the turn signals too close together for the DOT's liking on import. So when the turn signal is on, you're going to see that it's down here. Uh, and that means that these bulbs right here, where in the rest of the world the turn signals would be, are dead. Uh, there is a kit you can get to either make this another brake light or make it another running light. Or if you wanted to, you can also have the turn signals put back into the body to kind of clean this up a little bit and kind of bring it back to the, the design specification that it was meant to have. This is the engine on your Primavera. If you ever need to check the oil, the dipstick is right here. Just twist it all the way out, wipe it off, all the way back in, all the way back out, and then uh, check the level there. The engine, of course, is not going to be incredibly powerful. It's a 50cc, but it is a fuel-injected, four-stroke, air-cooled, three-horsepower engine. It is smooth, it is quiet, and most importantly, it is incredibly reliable. And fuel injection on this bike means that you can let this scooter sit if there are months where you're just not interested in riding because it's too cold, too rainy, too snowy, whatever. Ideally, you're gonna be storing the scooter in a garage under some kind of cover in these conditions. And ideally, you're hooking it up to a battery tender to ensure that battery is still alive when you wanna ride again. Other than that, like there's no carburetor to clog, which is fantastic. If you're coming off of a carbureted scooter and you're used to like having to ride it every two weeks to make sure that you know when you go to ride it, it actually starts, those days are over for you. Fuel injection is a higher pressure system, so clogs in a fuel injector are extremely rare. Chances are a fuel related starting issue is, is no longer going to be a problem for you. The wheels on your Vespa Primavera are going to be a 12 inch alloy with a disc brake on the front and a drum brake in the back. So the length of the Primavera is just a touch over six feet long with a nearly four and a half foot wheelbase. And the scooter is just a touch under two and a half feet wide uh, from lever to lever. The mirrors are going to add a little bit to that, but you can't really tell the mirror distance because they'll be in a different spot for each rider. The seat height on the Primavera is 31.1 inches. If you're a shorter rider, probably five foot to maybe five and a half feet, or if you have a shorter inseam, you're probably gonna to wanna to come to your local dealer and sit on one of these and make sure that it's comfortable. See if you can maybe touch both feet to the ground or if you can touch at least one to the ground and then still handle the weight of the scooter. Um, if you're not comfortable on a scooter, you won't wanna ride it and then nobody wins. The Primavera 50 lineup is just like the Sprint in that it weighs 255 pounds uh, and it has a very low center of gravity. Almost all the weight in the scooter is under the seat down here in the engine uh, around the rear tire. That makes it real easy to maneuver. You can kind of shift your hips and you're just in the next lane, no problem. And the Vespa lineup in general, Primavera no exception, has a long list of accessories that can be added to it that are either OEM factory parts, front racks, back racks, windscreens, cow guards, etc. And also there's a long list of aftermarket parts that fit the Vespa too. Next up, we'll talk about the break-in process and kind of servicing. On a 50cc, this is gonna kind of come naturally because chances are you're going to be riding on surface streets and there's stop signs and stoplights on surface streets. So you're going to be varying your throttle probably from nothing at all to full throttle and then back again every few blocks. And that's exactly what you want to do. You want to vary that throttle because you are generating heat in the engine every time you go uh, and throttle up. And you want to kind of just vary that heat, vary the speed, it'll help the engine break in a little easier. At the 600, 625 mile mark, you're going to want to get on the phone with your local dealer and set up your first service. Uh, your first service is going to get all those kind of factory break-in fluids out of there and make sure that everything is breaking in no problem. Also on the Primavera, 50cc and 150, same with the Sprint 50 and 150, there's going to be a valve adjustment on the first service as well, where they're gonna pop this cap off right here and go in with feeler gauges and check the, the valve clearance. Uh, very important to do on the first service, uh, recommended by the factory. It's something they want to see done if you ever have any kind of warranty issue. Speaking of the warranty, every Vespa comes with a two year unlimited mile warranty and that warranty is actually transferable to a different person. So if you bought a scooter today and sold it to me privately tomorrow, I could go to a dealer, say, here's the bike I've got, here's the VIN number, can you update me in the system? And they can actually switch the ownership of the bike in the Piaggio portal to the new owner, which is me. And what's really cool about that is that most manufacturers are trying to get out of the warranty as soon as they can. So if there's a private sale, whoop, not our problem anymore, even though you know maybe it was bought yesterday and sold the day after. Um, the fact that Vespa 
Piaggio and Vespa, allow you to transfer your warranty to another person really speaks volumes about their confidence in the product they make. Beyond that first service of 600 to 625 miles, you're going to have to come in every 3,000 miles for what is it called a routine service. That's mostly fluid-based, spark plug, etc. cetera. Um, that is another one just kind of lubricating, making sure everything is going well. Every 6,000 is going to be a major service. Um, different shops might have different names for it. We call it routine and major. Um, I don't know what they call it. I don't work there. Uh, the major service is going to be replacing the drive belt, the rollers, and of course all the same fluid changes that would happen on a routine service. And that is going to be so that uh, when you're full throttle uh, someday, that all of a sudden the belt in there doesn't snap because it's worn out or cracked or old or whatever, and then you're just giving it gas and it won't do anything because essentially the, uh, the belt that drives this thing is broken. You don't want that to happen. So changing that thing out every 6,000 miles is a good idea. Also, if you let your bike sit for years, the rubber bits on it uh, can kind of dry out a little bit, crack. Um, so if you've had a bike sitting for a long time and you're bringing it into your service center and they're recommending a major service, even though you're not at that 6,000 interval or 12,000 or 18,000, it's probably due to the age of the rubber. Um, scooters like to be ridden. Disuse is abuse. You're gonna wanna ride this thing, not let it sit for like a year straight if you can help it. You know, go get an ice cream. Remind yourself why you got it in the first place. Scooters are fun. We said that a few times now. Scooters are fun. Ride them. Next up, we'll talk colors and pricing. The Vespa Primavera 50 has a few different versions, uh, and the MSRP range is going to be between $3,999 to $4,699, or $4,000 and $4,700 if you'd like to give us an extra dollar. The differences are all going to be aesthetic. Different trim packages, different colors, different special editions, that sort of thing will vary in price. This particular bike I'm standing with is a special edition Primavera. This is uh, Project Red. Uh, a portion of its sales will go to virus research around the world. It's a partnership they have going on with Vespa. But there's also like the Primavera Touring where you get a front rack, a back rack, and a windscreen for like not anywhere close to the, the price of those accessories uh, separately. That's like another 200 bucks or something like that. It's a shockingly good deal. Uh, there's also the Picnic Edition coming out soon, which will have a back rack and a, uh, a, a picnic basket. So there's just some different stuff. Uh, for colors and whatnot, you're gonna wanna check either our website, vespaportland.com or vespausa.com. And that will show you the lists of available colors in the current model years. Uh, for this market. Be careful when you Google image search Vespa and whatever the model is because the images that get returned to you might only be colors that are available in Australia or Europe or England specifically or Italy specifically or Mexico specifically. It all varies country to country. Years ago I was in Mexico City and really surprised to see that the Vespa GTS 300 was only available in dolomite gray and gloss black down there and we have like 10 colors in the US. Apparently they don't sell in Mexico because they're only bringing in the two different colors. Also keep in mind that every two years or so, Vespa will introduce and then also retire some of the more adventurous colors. So like the yellows or a special shade of green or those only tend to hang around for about two years before they get kind of put away and brought back at a later date. The reds, the whites, the blues, the blacks, that sort of thing, the kind of standard uh, four colors are always available, but there's going to be some kind of ancillary colors on the side. Like there's the, the orange right now, uh, a Rancho Impulsivo. Uh, really great color, but it's going to go away probably in a year. Um, so if that's, that's for you, get on it now. When you're ready to make your purchase at your local dealership, whether it's us or somewhere else in the country, of course, factor in, you've got MSRP, but the reality of vehicle sales is that there are added things on there. Uh, Thankfully, uh, for us staying in business, the, these bikes are not available on Amazon Prime. Um, so that means that there's no free shipping. Uh, we're, you're shipping a 250 something pound scooter on a crate and uh, that has a cost associated with it on a light LTL truckload uh, service. So there's a freight charge, there's a setup fee, there's local taxes, whatever those may be. Uh, Oregon, we have an Oregon privilege tax, which is meant to incentivize electric cars. Uh, so there's like a 0.5% of MSRP tax here. Um, your state might be different. You might have sales tax, Oregon does not. One thing to note, you are not beating the system by buying a bike in Oregon and bringing it back to a sales tax state because they will just charge you that sales tax at the DMV when you go to register your bike. So 
they're gonna get their money, don't you worry. Uh, Oregon makes you do four years of DMV up front on any new vehicle. So in Multnomah County, where we're located, of course, it's the highest. It's like 420 something dollars for uh, four years up front, uh, just for the DMV registration. After that, you go to every two year increments and there is no kind of DEQ or smog if you're from California uh, to do on these things. And then uh, different states are, of course, going to vary what they require, what the prices are, et cetera. Here in Oregon, it varies from county to county. Multnomah, Washington, Clackamas, and everybody else all have different rates for that four-year term. Another thing to keep in mind is that as of April 2022, global supply chain issues are still a big problem. We just got our first shipment of Vespas in this year, and it is mid-April. Uh, before that, we were just kind of living on what we had left over from the prior uh, prior year. They're all current model year, but they just didn't have any bikes for the first four months. So keep in mind that if you're looking at this scooter, so are other people. Uh, and if you want one, you should get on the phone with your local dealership, whether it's us or somebody else and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. I want the white Primavera 150. Do you have one? And if you don't, please get one going for me. You'll have to put a deposit down. Most places, um, when they have a deposit, it's non-refundable, but it is transferable to a different scooter. So make sure, of course, that you want the bike. Um, that's so you have a little skin in the game. That bike will be ordered for you. And then when it shows up, uh, your name is on it and no one else has taken it. Currently, it's taking between two to three months, sometimes longer, to, uh, to get a scooter in of a specific model and color. So it's also the time to ask yourself, do I really need a white one? Would I be okay with a blue one? Would I rather ride now or wait months? Um, being that it's so early in the year, you can probably get away with, you know, waiting a little bit. You're going to be right in the middle of riding season, that nice sunny weather by the time it shows up. But, you know, it's ultimately up to you. The main thing I want to convey is that it used to be really easy to get one of these things, and it's now a little bit harder. So uh, you got to kind of plan ahead, just like with everything else. So there you have it. This is the Primavera 50cc scooter. You can ride it with just a driver's license in Oregon, less in other places, full motorcycle endorsement in California, etc. It's a fun little scooter. It's going to go 30 miles an hour. It's on flat ground. Um, it's a good one to get around. It's a good one for a little commute. The gas mileage is incredible. You're going to fill this thing up for 10 bucks a month, maybe. And uh, it's just going to be a good time. It's a nice way to get into riding. And if you decide it's not for you, Vespas have incredibly high resale value and you should be able to recoup quite a bit of cash out of it if you just decide, I hate riding. But most people don't hate riding. If you have any questions, or you think we missed anything, please leave a comment in the uh, comment section below and we'll try to get back to you. I think we have responded to literally every comment we've ever gotten. Until the next video, this is Andrew at Vespa Portland. Thank you for watching. Ride safe out there. And if you can't ride safe, be good at it.